Hey everybody, I'm Christine Morell. Today I am sitting with Dylan Gavin. I'm so excited that you're joining me today because I found you on Facebook because you were posting all this awesome content helping other artists. You're an artist yourself, a gigging professional musician. And I just reached out to you because I released a book recently that had a bunch of list of agents and that sort of thing. And he had posted a comment that he had signed with a couple agencies within just sending a few emails onto you know some of those agents that were in my list in that book i thought that was amazing um all of the insight that you posted about you know how people should reach out to people and you know you gave a lot of insight to other musicians and singers that were having a hard time booking so i wanted to get into three main things that you would offer to anyone watching right now on how they can start making a living doing music how you book gigs but first let everyone know um, a little bit about yourself so that they know that they're talking to someone they can trust. Gotcha. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dylan Galvin. I am. Uh, I graduated Berklee College of Music in '09. Um, I did. Um, I was a professional music major uh, during my time at Berkeley. I got to study with John Mayer's guitar teacher, uh, Tomo Fujito. I actually studied, did some master classes with John Mayer himself. Uh, I, I worked with uh, James Taylor's brother, Livingston Taylor, um, and I. I've won some random various awards over the years and I've uh, been doing music professionally since graduating college. I have successfully avoided a nine to five day job. Um, but my, I mean, doing music is definitely, it's like two full-time jobs. So um, it's definitely kept me busy, but I've been able to do it and pay, pay off my student loans, my rent, uh, all my bills, everything um, for over 10 years now. And I play in Los Angeles, which is a very, uh, there's a lot of musicians here, so sometimes it can be thought of as being competitive, but um, knowing certain professional etiquette uh, really helps. And I learned a lot of things the hard way. Like I did a lot of wrong things. I, I have done pretty much every wrong thing. Um, so I can help you save some time here um, with the information. Awesome. I'm so excited. I'm so super excited. Um, We're going to get in, guys, to the top three things that Dylan Galvin says you need for you to book shows. And this is awesome. This is all going to be really, really great material. So make sure to take notes, pay attention, and let's go. Okay. So uh, it, there's a lot of like uh, preemptive groundwork that has to go in place before you start pitching yourself. It's like a job interview. Um, you, you have to, like, it's, if you don't show up like wearing the right thing, even if you're good, it's just going to represent you poorly. So um, the three things I have, the, the first one, the first one is more of a mindset thing, not to get too woo woo, but it's, uh, cultivating the attitude, no, I agree. Of a, this is um, cultivate the attitude of a servant. So never think, uh, how does this person benefit me? How does this, how is this agency going to help me instead? If you truly consider your skill set and your talents and how your talents could benefit their brand, their ethos, um, that mindset alone will help you switch. It'll help. Um, it'll change your approach in the way you interpret the interaction with the agency. So that's very helpful. Um, also, how much you make in this industry is correlational to the value you provide. So if you're always looking on how to get a leg up for yourself, um, your value for other people remains low because you're not helpful to them. You're just this, this sponge of trying to just take advantage of everything and you, you're, you're worthless in, in the industry. So um, if instead you're always trying to help other people, your value increases. So, and this is more of a mindset than anything tangible, but it applies to all the things that are tangible. Um, and don't try and get on rosters to get famous or because it's cool or because like, I don't know, it's trendy. Just take a look at each agency and research the people in it. Like actually find them personally on social media profiles. Do you agree with them on their values? Do you like their style and their brand and the type of artists that they book? If so, reach out to them. And when you do these things that you say to them will be genuine. But if you simply try to get an agent to book you because you want them to help you and you could really care less as long as they're helping you, you won't come off as genuine because you're not genuine. Um, and they'll sense that. that people are very good at detecting like garbage and they're going to, they're going to pick up on that. Um, even if you carefully craft everything, like they'll just know and um, they'll probably go with somebody else. Um, I, I love this. I just want to like say thank you that you're sharing this because I, I actually talk about this in a lot of videos. I always say that it's, you got to be very aware of the questions that you ask um, because a lot of people ask, what can you do for me? What are you going to do for me? What value are you going to give me? 
But if the question, this is just reiterating exactly what you're saying. If the question that you ask is, what value am I going to give to this venue? What value am I going to give to this agency? What value do I give to my fans? You'll always receive because you're giving something and that's what we naturally do. We exchange, right? If we make a great hamburger, someone's going to give us money for that hamburger. If we make great music, someone's going to give us money for that music. If we know how to entertain, people are going to pay us. But so many people get on stage and just go, people should pay me just because I'm up here rather than what am I actually doing for this place? Am I making the, you know, bringing more people in? If not, am I making the people that are here spend more money at the bar? Or, you know, what am I doing to bring value and to justify why I should put money in my hand? Yeah. From person so exactly. i love that thank you because it is it's like uh, ultimately at the end of the day it's a monetary exchange so like they're they're giving a temporary investment into you it's it's like a very short term it's like a it's like a loan in a sense it's you're going to give them roi if they pay you 500 dollars and you gave them 100 dollars of business it costs them 400 dollars to have you so why would they ever have you back that doesn't make any sense um so exactly. and the final thing under the 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 my number one bullet point is uh your job is to give an agent value. So you want to have yourself established in a, a fully polished package and you just want to hand that package to them. So there's no work required on their part, make their job easy. And that's another thing that's tied into value. Um, if you can do that and bring your experience and your skills and your value to them in a nicely wrapped package, you greatly in increase your chances of them adding to, uh, adding you to their roster. So you you want to like bypass the, the 9,000 emails that they get a day of people saying, yo, yo, so I'm the hottest person on the planet right now. Like, oh, check out my, like, dude, the second you say that, your, your email goes in the garbage. Like, I promise you, they're so sick of people. Like, if you don't have, like, professional business etiquette, like, they won't even, they will never, like, listen to you. They'll never listen to anything you say. It doesn't matter how many Spotify streams you have. It doesn't matter. It's the same as a conversation with someone on the street. If you start off by talking about yourself before you've done anything else, the person, they'll be cordial because it's face to face, but they don't care. And on the internet, they don't have to pretend to care because it's the internet. So they'll just dump your email and you'll never hear from them. And when you send out a hundred emails and you get no responses, that's why you're not providing any value and your email is probably really poorly worded as well. So that's uh, point number one is cultivate the attitude of a servant, someone that is going to come like humbly before them and help them. Don't think about yourself. Just think about how you can help them. And don't just go around like trying to fake that attitude so you can get a one up, like actually figure out who you want to pitch yourself to so that when you come before them and you, you want to serve them, you're genuine and you actually like you want to do it. Because if you if it's some agency and you're doing it because you just want the status of being with them, but you keep that in mind. Um, well, and, you know, you talk about giving them a finished package, right? It's kind of like. If you have an idea for a hamburger, but then you have the hamburger, right? Yeah. And I keep using a hamburger as an idea. You know, someone give you $5 for like, I have this like idea of this hamburger. I'll, I can tell you about it. Or you have the hamburger, it's done. Like yeah, here, yeah. you can buy it right now for $5. Yeah. Here, it's finished. Now, are you going to elaborate on what that package looks like? Oh, yes. That's my third. Like, what yeah. Okay. Yep. That's another third one. Okay, got it. Okay, so what is number two? Number two is- I wanted to make sure, because I know some people are like, well, what is that? Yeah. And all the all the tangible stuff I saved for the last bullet point. The first two are kind of like more mindset things. Um, but I wanted to give people like a list of things. Do these things, and this will help. Um, so number two is have an ambition to consist constantly and consistently improve your skill set. Don't be the level you are in five years. You should be way better than you are now, and you should always be willing to learn. And a lot of times on social media, you'll see people. Uh, uh, pitching digital marketing things. And that's exactly what Kristen does. She has uh, like, you have like the automated system of the Facebook ads, which is linked to an email autoresponder. Don't automatically presume all those are scams. Like if you, if you have that mindset, like everyone's trying to scam you, it's like, it's like being willfully ignorant. It's like, you're, you're justifying the fact that you don't want to do work and the information on you becoming really good at stuff is more prevalent than it ever has been in the history of the world. You can learn almost anything in the world. Like you can't really learn heart surgery via the internet, but you can learn <laughs> business strategies. You can learn uh, digital marketing. You can learn like so many helpful things on the internet through those people that are marketing to you. And, and the reason why they're marketing is because people who have already done this have 
turned this trial and error process into like coaching sessions or digital modules or something like that. You can skip the trial and error phase, which usually takes months or years by just throwing $20 at something. And it's almost like when you pay that money, it opens up a door and that door, like just, it's like a cheat code that you can save so much time. Cause I've done it the slow way a lot. I've done it the hard and the slow way. And if you were, if you want to do it all by trial and error, like you will, you won't get anywhere. It'll take you like 70 years to learn everything. So just like be willing to pay money to advance your career. And, and musicians, we're like the worst business people in the world because we're, we're all for like spending all this money on like a poster or, or like all, dropping all this money on music gear. But the second it comes to like educating yourself on something, like everything's a scam all of a sudden. It's like, dude, that, that's not the way it works. Um, sometimes, sometimes there are um, people who are kind of scammy. They do, they do like a mixture of like uh, white hat marketing and black hat marketing. And white hat marketing is like basically using marketing strategies to get the right product in front of the right person. And black hat is like, hey, here's four hacks for the algorithm on Spotify to get you 100,000 plays or, or get like 50,000 uh, Spotify listens in 24 hours. All those like overnight things, they don't work. They're all scams and they all will bite you in the end. I've done some of them, so I know. Um, don't do anything that's like get 10,000 likes in like 24 hours. I literally have messed up. <laughs> they're all um, bots. Yeah. But <laughs> I've I, done it too. I did it too because I was like, what is this? Because they're like, I guarantee you it's real people. And then you click on their profile and it's just like one photo of like an orange. And I'm yeah, like, it's like, it is, it's like, it's technically a real person. And like, literally they're not lying. It's not bot. It's a real person. But what they don't tell you is that these are click farm countries where um, they don't have the best economy. So people are literally hired to make profiles and then just like things all day. And that's their job. And so that was a real person. Yes, they created a real profile and they liked your thingy. You got your page in front of them. That's the only interaction you will ever get with them for the rest of your life is that one like, and they'll never buy anything. They'll never come to your show because they're just in a room clicking like all day. And that's what they don't explain to you. So and at that point, at that point, I mean, you can't monetize that. So you can't make money off of fake, you know, yep. or even whether it's real people, they're not real fans. They don't yep. care about your music. It's better to have a hundred real fans than to have 10,000 people who don't care. Yep. We're just in the Philippines you know, hitting like, right? Yep. So you can't monetize that at all. At that point, the people that are spending all this money on YouTube plays and uh, Instagram likes and all these things, they're doing it just for vanity, yep. just so that someone opens their Instagram and goes, oh my God, you have 20,000 followers. Yep. You know, it, it gives them some sort of, you know, like, I'm cool. I'm the cool person in the room. But if you can't make money off of it, what does it matter? You know, if you're going right back to your job at the gas station and you're not doing what you love, why did you waste that money? You could have very well spent that money. Again, what you talked about that musicians never spend on, but educating yourself on things instead of let me get 10,000 likes overnight, thinking that that's going to somehow translate into money, which it yeah. doesn't. So that's a great point. Yeah. And, um, and also on top of that, when you do those hacks to like get a bunch of likes on your Facebook page, not only is it not valuable, it damages your actual fans, it damages your, the algorithm, senses this humongous chunk of your Facebook likes that never engage with anything. And so then the, al the algorithm goes, oh, the content you're posting sucks. So we're gonna derank it and favor someone else's content. And then your actual fans who wanna see you, they stop seeing your stuff because some dude in Bangladesh, you know, clicked like, <laughs> just be aware of that. Like there's, there's not really, um, th you can hack things but that's not a hack that's legitimate in terms of hacking, like paying money to educate yourself is, is like a form of hacking because you're learning something that someone already took the time to get the data. That's the hacking you should do. Don't try to like throw money at something so that you don't have to do any work for it. Throw money at something so that you get the information you need to then work so that your time and your energy is spent effectively um, rather than just like throwing things to the wind and see what, what sticks because I've done that a lot and uh, I had to learn a lot of hard lessons and that's why I bought your uh, your list because I lined up a tour uh, it was my second tour across the United States um, I did a completely uh, solo tour from the west coast to the east coast and back and a lot of the venues wow uh, researching venues first of all you have to go on the internet like you go on google 
and you just like music venues, music, like you have to determine if it's even a music venue that has your type of music. Then you have to do all these gymnastics to find out who does the booking in, in the turnaround on restaurants and bars is like so fast and it's never the same person. And I even have like old contacts from a previous tour and I went to go contact them and they're all gone. And so it's like, I lost touch with that venue. So um, you then have to do that. Mm -hmm. And then you have to send the right email to them and pitch yourself properly. And it's just like, if you just pay for that list, it saves so much time. Cause it, it, I think it's about, it's about a week per, per like, uh, per venue. Per it, venue. Like it, if you're, if you're shooting randomly, like in the dark and it's hours and hours of work. And at some point you're like, I don't want to be a professional Google music venue searcher. I want to play freaking music. So <laughs> how do I not do this? Then you pay money to someone who already did all that. And then you can save that time. That's when you should spend your money. And that, that the, the list that Kristen made is like a hack. So I would suggest doing that. Hack. Thank you. No, that's a huge point. I had, I had set up a 25 city tour a couple months ago. I mean, a couple years ago, a couple months ago, a couple years ago. And I did it myself, you know, making all the calls. And I tell everyone, I'm like, it took me three months to yeah. set it up. And while I was on tour, I was still booking for the last few weeks of the tour. So I was still on tour following up with venues so that the last six weeks of the tour, because it was three months on the road, the last six weeks, you know, I was still following up on emails, you know, checking with the booking agents, checking, you know, working out where we were going to stay and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot of work. If you can just yeah. fast through that part, that'll save you the most time. But you talked about how um, there's a lot of... Um, like scammy things out there and that a lot of people kind of have this attitude that everything that they see online is a scam, right? And also everything out there is like a conspiracy that the government like hates us and you know, everything is just, you know, everything's a conspiracy, everything's a scam. Yeah. I deal with it because a lot of people, you know, reach out to me and they're like, you're a scam all the time. But we have the internet now where people can actually research other people. And this is what I tell people, I'm like, I'm like, all you have to do is, all you have to do is like for me, you know, and I'm like, just go to my Instagram and you'll see that for the last 10 years, I've been like traveling the world. So obviously if I'm going to share this information with you, then it's probably from experience. You know what I mean? And so that's what becomes kind of crazy because so many people are like, nope, it's a scam, but they don't even do any type of research. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's that they're, they're self-validating their own laziness or like, yes. they're like, well, I don't want, I don't want to accept the reality that be, being a musician is this hard. So I'm going to just make up a narrative that it's all lies and um, I just haven't got my big break yet. And it's what I imagine it to be. And everyone else is like trying to scam me. It's like, no, it's, it's, it's really hard. Like okay. if you don't like working hard, yeah. <laughs> go, don't be a musician, trust me. You're gonna work way harder. Go get a job. Than, than, than a normal <laughs> job. Yeah, it's, this is not- Go get a regular job. Yeah, that's what I always tell everybody too. I'm like, if you're not ready to like put your heart and soul into this and like go through like ups and lots of downs, it's not for you. Like, it's just really not. And, and what's funny is I got interviewed recently for another uh, blog and they were like, what would you say to the regular person that is thinking about quitting in music? And I think they wanted me to have this like big uplifting message. And I was like, they should probably quit. Quit it's now. Not for them. <laughs> like they should probably go apply for another job. Like, I don't know what to say. And the guy starts laughing and he goes, you know what? You're right. I think he was expecting me to be like, no, believe in yourself. No, no, no. It's not for everybody. It's not, it's not for the weak at heart. It's not for people that try things once and they're like, eh, that didn't work. Yeah. It's not for people that blame the rest of the world. It's not for people that are like, it's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. You know, it's not for people like that. It's people that can look at themselves in the mirror and go, I'm responsible for my life, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I can give myself credit if it's awesome. And I can look at my life and constructively go, this is where I've messed up and why, you know, my world has manifested in this way. Yeah. I'm powerful enough to make changes and make choices. And I know that the choices that I make will ultimately manifest into something amazing if I do my research, educate myself and take action and not blame the rest of the world. All right. And then the last, the last of the three points. Uh, well, okay, so there, I have two more. Technically, I was only supposed to have three, but there's, I just had to put it in a fourth one. The third one is the big one. This is uh, your brand identity slash your value. This is how you actually put the value into what you do. Because I talked about how, like, you need to have value. This is how you do it. So first of all, you need to know who you are and who you are not. Do not be all things to all people. Um, 
in, in a sense you want to, but in another sense you don't. Uh, you do want to try and um, be malleable, but you don't want to dilute your own identity so that you're trying to be like, I'm a rock singer and I do 90s covers, but I'm also like a hip hop guy. And I also do a lot of Backstreet's Boys and I'm a sensitive singer songwriter. It's like, no, just define something and pick it and run with that and, and let it be something you like. Um, but if, if you're like, I like singing songs about sharks, that's too weird. Like that's too, <laughs> you can't, I mean, you can, maybe you can like market yourself as the person that sings about sharks, but it's a really, you have to be, keep in mind, it's a really niche market. So how many opportunities do you get? <laughs> sharks? Like how many people are going to want that? If the answer is no one, then you don't have a career. So you have to find like somewhat of a middle ground between like what you know people are going to want and what you truly want to do and like kind of go like somewhere in the middle of that. So the more close it is to you, the less work you'll have. And the closer you go to them, the more you might not necessarily like doing it. So find that healthy middle ground in between. Um, so yes, um, a little people pleasing to your set is okay, uh, but you don't need to worry that not everyone loves you all the time. And, and I would almost say that's not good. Um, you don't need to just you know play Sweet Caroline and Freebird and uh, wagon wheel on <laughs> yes um okay piano so, man you don't ever request piano man piano don't man. do it <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you're gonna like oh that's that's a creative one good job <laughs> <laughs> uh, four hours of cover songs so it is it is um gonna make you and this is for I'm kind of leaning towards an agency that's going to book you as a cover musician, but I'll try to nuance the difference between original agencies and cover agencies because they're both looking for very different things. They're not the same. And so are clients like an original music festival. You're not going to pitch yourself the same way to that as you will like someone who wants live entertainment for their wedding. So like these are two like separate identities and I've tried to take those separate things in find the elements of both that can have crossover and then use that as my identity for my website. And you can see that I have a portion of my website that's just for originals and a portion of it. Like I literally have a part in my sub menu that's like Dylan Galvin live entertainer. And that pops up a little menu and you can see all the things in that menu because that audience could care less about my original music and my original audience doesn't necessarily care about like all my cover songs there's a little crossover but not much like you can play cover songs at an original venue and you can play original songs at a cover venue but overall you want to pitch yourself differently because the end client is looking for very different things with each of those um and it took me a long time to balance my that's website. great i love that you brought that up yeah that, that i love was that you brought that up sorry tricky thing um i had to reformulate my website like 30 times or so before I found the right balance. Um, but yeah, I, I, if you ever want, if you want to steal it, just it's Dylan Galvin, Dylan, like Bob Dylan, Galvin, like Calvin and Hobbs with a G, uh, DylanGalvin.com. And you can go on there and you can see how, like when you first get, to I'll my actually website, put it on the screen. Okay. Awesome. It's like when you first get to my yep. website, it's, it's for original stuff. But when I have someone that wants to hire me for a wedding, I send them to, I actually send them to a secret link that's Dylan Galvin and then it's my live entertainer press kit. And that's like a one page version mm -hmm. of everything compiled into like one scrolling page that they would possibly need, but it's not mm -hmm. necessarily my original stuff. It's like all the things that would be for cover uh, artists and client testimonials are a huge part of that, but I'll get to that in a second. So you want four hours, four hours of cover songs four 50 minute sets. That's generally enough. C cover gigs are rarely longer than four hours and a four hour gig is kind of like a like by the end of it you're like oh, I go home. um five hours I, I don't <laughs> once i think um but generally four hours a lot of them are three or two and a half that's like most of them but four is good because then you'll have some backup songs and uh one hour of original music that's the generally like original festivals are only going to want you for one set um so if you have one hour of original music that's good. Four hours of covers. That's good. Um, you want to have a good live show. And this is only for engaged audiences, not for background gigs. Background gigs, actually, a lot of what I do are background gigs. And they're not, they're not particularly satisfying, like artistically. But you make money. You live off of them. And they help you get the better gigs. So the frustrating thing about background gigs is that no matter how good or not good you do, the reaction of the audience is generally always going to be the same. 
Uh, <laughs> they just don't react. You can be like, you can be Mozart. You can no play the amazing thing ever. And it's just like, it's like playing for a field of cows. Like they're just, they're not there to, for the experience. You're just like background noise. But for the, for the audiences that are engaged, um, this book right here, Every, everyone should get this book. Um, it's The Live Music Method by Tom Jackson or something. What's his name? Tom Jackson, yeah. Um, I'm not affiliated with him. He's not paying me money. He probably should. Um, <laughs> to, but but uh, this book um, basically is a methodical breakdown of everything to put in your show to make it maximally engaging. And Taylor Swift and uh, who else? Um, Jars of Clay um other artists have used this like like if you ever go to the band perry um it's it's live music production so not necessarily like fireworks and everything but like how to what what, what way to order your song so one thing he does is he take t take your whole set list and number your songs one to five in terms of how much energy their energy level and then you you basically graph out this certain um this like arc to your set and you want each set to follow this very specific flow and um each each song in the set list should have this uh continuation on the previous song and like there's certain moments where you talk and certain moments where like you go completely unplugged and walk into the audience and you create these moments as um kind of the show is like this giant advertisement for your brand and these moments are the real magic but that's what separates like a, a dude playing acoustic covers in the corner from like something that changed a person's life it's like putting those moments and doing everything intentionally. And he talks about like, from like, when you sing this line of the song, you lean to the left and you look at someone over to the left. And when you sing this lyric, like you look at someone to the right and you break the audience into like quadrants and you sing rotating to each one of the quadrants. As you, it's like so specific. I would have never figured any of this out. So this is the book. This will help um, at least help you start to think about the way to to create a good live show because an agent, particularly one for original music, they want you to have a good live show. They don't want you to just go up and do a song and then do another song. It has to be a full package of value. Um, and that's, that's what they're looking for. You want three to five videos showcasing what you do. And they can be, uh, it can be one promo video or it can be uh, separate instances of you playing live and pre-recorded stuff all mashed together that my my promo video is like it starts off with like a youtube song i did i pre-recorded all the audio i mixed it in logic and then i just set up a camera um, i literally set up i recorded it on my iphone using an app called pro shot and i used final cut pro um and i got three point lighting so um you're, you're gonna want lighting actually that's another thing i didn't think about Lighting makes your videos that that makes a huge difference in your videos. And here, I'll I'll show you. Um, I'm actually using this light right now. <laughs> this is a uh, Draco. Oh, great. Podcast. So this is a company. Um, they have a office in LA, but I think you can buy their stuff online. And it's called Dra Draycast or Draco Broadcast. This is a um, woo, It's really bright. This the reason why these lights are awesome is because you can switch between daylight and tungsten. And uh, see. So daylight is white and tungsten is yellow. So, okay, so now it's off. So tungsten is yellow and this is white. Lights in the past have always been either or, and it's really helpful to have this because you can get a more consistent look out of the lighting in your videos with that, but, um, and, it, and they're super cheap as far as lights go. So get those for your, for your, um, for your promo video. And um, that will really, really help your videos look a lot better. Uh, your EPK uh, or your gig resume. I, I think I would go with the EPK. The EPK is, it's a link to one page and it's everything that the agent is going to want. It's got professional headshots. It's got press quotes. It has client testimonials. Um, it has your, your videos. It has your audio. Um, anything else that would be um, a point of interest to the uh, agent. And I can't think of all of them right now, but I'll give you the link and whoever's watching this, you can just go and copy what I did because it worked. I, I get very good response for my EPK and I have two EPKs. I have an original EPK and then a cover artist EPK. So, and I'm always cognizant of what type of agency, like what their roster is like. 
and what they're looking for and only send the right one to the right agency. Like don't send your, I'm a live wedding entertainer to some person who's trying to book a festival. They're going to be like, we don't want a wedding singer. We want like a creative stomp folk band or, you know, whatever your thing is. Um, client testimonials, super, super important. I have a whole page on my website dedicated to client testimonials. Social proof is people are like, we're like, we're like little sheep. We, we, um, if we, you just need someone else to kind of give the go ahead, like the first person who's going to start dancing at the night, you need that first person to start dancing because everyone else is going to follow them, but they're not going to do it until that one person And the client testimonials are like the people on the dance floor. They're already, they're saying, Hey, look, I, I booked this person. They did not like headbutt my grandmother and light my house on fire. They're legitimate. So, um, the more of those you can accumulate and the more specific they are, the better. Don't make them up. Don't make up client testimonials. Don't get your mom to write you one. Um, just go, to, if you don't have any right now, you can send out uh, messages or emails to people you've played with in the past and tell them to give you something honest. I wouldn't worry about Yelp. Uh, no one really uses Yelp for uh, live musicians. Sometimes they do, but you don't really need it. You can just put them right on your website. Um, also, uh, Gig Masters and Gig Salad. I think Gig Masters is now called The Bash. These are kind of like mus musician directories, um, but they're, they're, they're like lead generation services for you. And you can get, if you get all this stuff together, you can put all that stuff there and get yourself in front of uh, clients who pay for, for music. So you don't have to, these are the kind of shows like you don't have to bring anyone to. You just show up and you do your thing, you play songs and it doesn't have to like be an amazing show. Like you can just do your thing of cover songs in the corner. And that's actually, they're really good to like get used to performing on stage um, using those two. And um, probably the last thing would be a list of previous venues and press. And if you've played, uh, I played a show for Levi's, um, like the jean, Levi's jeans. I went on the internet and I found the logo for Levi's. And I put that on the front page of my live entertainer part of my website because the second someone sees that logo, their brain goes, oh, uh, that's familiar. That's like a big deal. And then they're intrigued. So it's a logo is more effective than text. So if, if you've played for any companies or any clients that have like recognizable logos, put those logos on your website. I stole this from an idea I saw. Um, there was a, a guy from England who was like a wedding singer and he did this on his website. I was like, that's a good idea. I just, I literally Googled yep. Uh, acoustic musician I think or like live entertainer and I got like the top five search results on Google and I was like what what are they what are they all doing and I just copied the best ideas and I put that on my website and so that's all I did I didn't smart do anything well, people don't have an excuse anymore like if you want to know how to do something you just google it like you said and I've used you know when I first started out going to like these websites like gig salad and gig masters which I didn't realize they changed the name but you can go on there and you can see what everybody else is doing you can yeah. see their promo videos you can see their song lists you can yeah. see how they describe themselves you can literally go on there and save yourself like 10 years of figuring out or five years or whole, however much time and you can literally just copy what someone else is doing right then and there and customize it obviously to be you choose yeah. your own songs but you can just see hey these people look like they're getting booked a lot it'll actually show you how many shows that they've booked it'll show you they booked 100 shows so you would go on there and say this person's booked a hundred shows. They must be doing something right. Let me see their promo video. Let me see what songs they're singing. Let me see what their photos look like. Let me see what they're wearing when they take these photos. These are all things that are really important. We have to treat this like a business. I know too many people that are treating this like a hobby. Exactly. And you, you, you want to think of like your EPK is like, it should be an extension of you. The better it looks and the better everything is together, they're going to presume that you are as good as your EPK seems to be. But you'll never get the chance to show them that you're good if your EPK looks like garbage. Also, before you do any of this, it is a good idea to become good at performing. Like, be good before you do it. <laughs> you're not good. Don't yes. do any of this, literally. Forget everything. Get lessons on, like, just get good first. And then, because you don't have anything to say. <laughs> At the root, at the root of all this is you're, you're right. providing a live performance. You're providing live entertainment and music. And if you suck at music, you have no business doing anything else after that. Like, don't be a life coach if you're like, 
you know, this slob li- like playing Xbox all day and you like, don't do that. You have to get something. Yeah. I meet so many people that are like, I'll learn my songs once I have a gig. I'll learn the songs once someone hires me. And I'm like, how is so, that's like saying, I'll learn how to cook once someone hires me to be a cook. Yeah, that does, yeah. Does that make any sense? Like, it doesn't make any sense. But some, for some reason, in the entertainment world, we're a bunch of lazy people out there no. going, no, you should just book me because I can sing. Watch, listen, I can sing. Watch, listen. Well, what does yeah. that do, though? Does that make people buy alcohol? Does that make people buy food? Does that make people buy tickets? If it doesn't, then you, you could have the best voice in the world, but if you don't have an EPK for them to hear it so that they can see that you're great and hire you, you don't know songs, so you can show, what are you gonna do if you show up and you don't know songs already? They can't hire you if you don't have a product, just like someone's not gonna give you money for a product that doesn't exist. Yeah. They're just not, not gonna do that. So yeah. you have to be prepared first. It's like you go to school and get your degree, then you go apply for the job. You don't, hey, I wanna be a heart surgeon. I'm gonna go to college someday, you should hire me. Yeah, exactly. Let me, let me, I'll, I'll do a heart surgery on you. We'll, we'll, we'll work out, right? <laughs> you should give me like your heart and money and let me like, yeah, do heart surgery. That's going to be great. I'm sure that's going to work out well. Yep. And you don't like, it's not per, like, it's not like you're, you're being good is correlational. Um, like if, if you have, um, it's not the most talented person that gets the gig. It's like the talent does matter, but it's not like the ultimate factor. It's like, it's like, professionalism and talent and like your ability to market essentially um those three things are like in balance that makes you very appealing so like there could be someone that's way better at you on your instrument or singing but like you know how to write an email you're gonna get the gig and so you don't have to worry about like well i'm not the best who cares it doesn't matter like like there's so many famous artists who are not the best but they know the business so um I always tell yeah. everybody that I'm like, you want to, you want to see how talent doesn't matter. Turn on the radio. Like 90% of them can't even sing. And what they did though, is they learned the business. Yep. That's what they did. They learned the steps. They were willing to do the work. That's why they're, you know, that's why they're successful. It goes in any business, including yeah. ours. All right, everybody. That was Dylan Gavin. Thank you so much for joining me today. You shared so much information. I know people are like on information overload. I'm going to put lots of links to other tutorials and other things that he mentioned in this interview and also links to your EPK because I know people are going to want to see that. You're going to, they're going to want to see what you've done to successfully book gigs. So I'm going to put all of that in there. So thank you so much, Dylan. Thank you for having me.